two salons in a row. There we go. Uh, two meetings in a row, I wore the same sweater. And then I thought, what if somebody's watching these one after another? What if they're binge watching the salons at home and they would think that I only had one sweater? I have a lot of sweaters. Uh, greetings, everybody. Um, yes, as Molly said, we it, this is a very interactive session. So you can either use the chat to put in comments um, or use the raise hand feature. Physically raising your hand doesn't work because when I show slides, we can't see everybody. So we won't be able to see that your hand is physically up. But if all you want to type in the chat is raised hand, that will also work as a way for us to know that you want to speak. Um, I will start by acknowledging that Blue Sky always acknowledges that our programming is held on the traditional lands of the Multnomah, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Bands of Chinook, Tualatin, Kalapuya, Malala, and many other tribes who made their homes along the Wimal and Willamette rivers, which we today call the Columbia and Willamette. We also acknowledge that in this online format, you may be participating from other areas, and we invite you to consider your own land acknowledgement that reflects your location. We also acknowledge that this very technology that we rely on for online programs is inequitably distributed and not equally accessible, and that creates new virtual displacements and exclusions. And we always call attention to these things in terms of the need for action now and the future to uh, address these disparities. So welcome everybody. Um, and I wanna thank Molly for taking the extra step of also being the tech support tonight um, and say a fare thee well, I think in absentia to Amanda and Zemi who are both moving on to exciting new things after uh, long since supporting Blue Sky. Um, well, what a year this has been. We have moved through a lot. Um, we started doing these online programs at the pretty early in the pandemic um, when George Floyd was murdered, we pivoted the programming pretty much immediately to address that. Um, we've also been through a year where we felt like there were some possibilities for real movement around racial justice. Here in the state of Oregon, we had the worst wildfires I think the state has ever seen, certainly the worst in the time I've been here. We went through a really hectic election cycle and through it all, we have been using the lens of photography and of poetry in these programs to come together and deepen our understanding around lots and lots of things. Um, these programs started physically in the gallery. I wanted to create a, a sense of community, a way for people to get to talk about the photographs were, that were up and also to bring in more voices by adding poetry that had something to do somehow, maybe just only in my head, with the photographs that were on the wall at any particular time. And when we have these discussions, either in person or online, the goal is always that we're building our understanding together. So when I ask questions, there is never one right answer. Um, and if you leave thinking the same thing that you did when you came in, I probably haven't done a very good job. I certainly want to leave thinking more deeply or differently than I do now, even uh, with photographs and poems that I've looked at a lot. Um, so it might be worth just for those who have been through these uh, in the past to think about whether the salons have changed at all how you read photographs or how you read poems. We've been doing this for about a year online and just think about what effect that might have had on your readings. And maybe if nobody has any thoughts on that, rather open-ended question, I'll start sharing screen so that you can see the, um, the first photograph that we'll be talking about. And I should say, I feel like we have these salons every month, which is just enough time for me to feel like I forget some of the technical pieces. So be kind as I share my screen and hopefully share what I intend to share. Um, hmm. It's not doing what I wanted to do. Did I tell you this would happen? I thought I did. Okay, there we are. And I can sort of see you guys. Um, so here's our first photograph. And maybe we'll start with just doing a close reading of it. Take a moment and 
notice what you notice right away. Notice what you notice after you've looked for a while. Maybe think about how the photograph makes you feel. Oh, that's not what I meant to do. So any, anybody want to jump in with either something you noticed right away or something that it took you a little more time to notice looking at the photograph? Well, this is Albert. <laughs> I noticed uh, milk drops and then uh, went into the gloves and then thought it went right to cow udders and then life-giving uh, fluid, you know, not just with cows, but with uh, so many mammals. Yeah, do you, this is an interesting question about whether, whether uh, we would have thought others looking at this image if we didn't have the title to tip us off that we were looking at milk. What do you think? Oh, I don't think so. I mean, I, I went right for it, yeah. It just, it just really looks like cow udders, but you know, and I had, I didn't look at the title, I don't think, before I looked at the photo. Okay. So. <clears throat> and we have, um, I think Ralph has his hand raised and then Chris. Okay, great. So Ralph, would you unmute, please? I just did and here, here I am, I think. Um, what's interesting about the image for me is that the that you don't know by just looking at it if it's utter or if it's glove. And because the uh, reference is uh, blacked out. So when I looked at it, I thought it was gloves, but then the number didn't add up. And then the holes were in there. And then it seemed to me, no, this is maybe the, the openings. And then there is a squirt. But to me, it's very ambiguous what it is, even though uh, it ends up being milk, I presume, uh, but um, I think it's just much more ambiguous. It could be a number of things, and that's what I'm sort of looking forward to. And Chris, you're next. Yeah, I, I don't find myself literally not being able to tell, but uh, I think that in the meaning of the image, I think it's that it has to do with that you're milking something other, or this cow, which I'm not giving uh humanity status too <laughs> and then you look and you discover that what you're milking is the same it's hands just like the hands you're using to milk it so i think there's a uh there's a um, a sort of call to empathy sort of built into the structure of the image and you know i'm speaking as a man who, who had never had a baby and never had a uh, uh had to, had to milk themselves so they could go to work Right, you're a lactation-free observer. Um, so, but there's something very literal here, even though there's kind of this back and forth about the udders versus the gloves, but Ken has put into the chat stars and meteors. Um, Ken, do you wanna tell us a little bit more about what you were, what got you there? Just, the, um, you know, the movement of the drops, the dark background, the light mm -hmm. bits, and the, and the sort of linear movement. Right, so there's stars to mind and meteors. Right, so there's this, uh, this other piece here of seeing the weirdness of the light color on the background and what I, think is implied motion of the droplets in the air. I'm not sure what to make of how dark the background is on here. Does anybody have any thoughts? Yeah, 
if the background were not black, what would we see? Would we, would we see the cow, for example? And, and would that change the whole meaning of the photograph? That's a good question. I think that was Pancho, if I recognize the voice. The, yes, um, you do, <laughs> Lois. <laughs> the, um, that the, somebody said earlier it, that, it, that the, that's what there is blacked out. And I'm not sure that's actually true just because of looking at the shadow on the arm. I think that this is photographed against, I, I don't even know. Uh, I don't know how the photograph is taken or how the light is working, but there is something to me, well, I guess I should ask you all, what's the, what's the effect of this some, in some ways very uh, concrete image, hands, glove, liquid that we're thinking is milk, um, in some ways, the sort of spectral star meteor is implied in the pattern. Um, it feels really tactile to me in some ways. And in other ways, it's, it's really um, mysterious because of that background. Like, what is the effect this photo is having on you? So we have hands raised. We have Chris and then Marvin and then Albert. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, it, it appears to be lit with flash. Oh, it might not be, it might be just a, a bulb. <laughs> but um, but the, the background is black because it's too far away to be illuminated sufficiently to show up. Um, and uh, if the background was not blacked out, you wouldn't see the milk drops very well. I mean, if this was shot against Paul D'Amato's imaginary bookshelf, you, you just wouldn't see it. That it, that it needs the dark to, to do that work. Yeah, and I think it also, it also makes the image feel more like it's not part of the ordinary world. It makes yeah. it feel more sort of mythical and, uh, and you know, like this is, um, uh, this is something that's maybe like the Mexican Loteria cards or maybe like uh, Greek myths or something like that. Those are fantastic references. Um, was who was up next? Um, Marvin is next. Yeah, um, thanks. I think it doesn't give us any context, which forces you to give it context. Basically, um, where is this? Well, the artist is not telling us. We have to decide that. And I think what we decide influences how we react to the image. And Albert had his hand up. I'm not sure if you would want to continue, Albert. Well, at first I uh, kind of agreed with Christopher, but the other thing is if it were a light background, you wouldn't see the freeze action of, you know, the, the milk coming right out of one of the fingers of the glove. Uh, as a matter of fact, it made me clean my screen just to make sure <laughs> that all the white spots I saw were part of the picture. Uh, but, you know, you the drops halfway down, that kind of thing. So if I think it was anything that dark, it would be hard to catch. That's all. Yeah, and I think it also, it reminds us that there's, a, um, this is a captured moment when there's motion, drops are in motion and we're just seeing them captured. And uh, we another comment in the chat, chat about the carnival at night fireworks. I like the carnival thing too, because uh, you know, this is a, I'm a fan of the Oregon State Fair. I feel like it brings together our, our milking and our fireworks. Um, right, and Doris has added that there's a there's motion, but it's also frozen in the moment that the flash and the picture are capturing. And, and Laura has her hand raised as well, Laura. Yeah, I'm also wondering the, the, the blackness there, the absence of, I'm, I'm wondering what would we put or what would I put in that space? There's a part of me that wants to open my mouth and be at the bottom of that, you know, to receive because it's such a, it's a generous expression to me, you know, it's a relief um, and, and, and an offering and refreshing. So that's, so I just sort of would like to wonder if, where where that's all going because that's like you know the milk of loving kindness or whatever however we want to uh, you know approach what, the milk 
um, it, to me, it's a it's a beautiful offering. And yeah, it's, right. That that milk itself is a is a laden with meaning liquid, right? That if it, if they said Dr Pepper or mustard, <laughs> it wouldn't mean the same thing that yeah. that milk might mean. Yeah. Um, and uh, Albert is telling us this is no, those aren't otters. This is that's not how milking of cows go. And I think that's true. I think that these are gloves. I feel yeah. particularly like the one that is um, in the right hand of the person being photographed looks like it's got, you can see the tie of the glove at the top, which also indicates just how um, artificial this scene is. Like it feels like we're capturing a moment, but somebody's worked very hard to make this moment happen. Um, and Chris has added, yeah, maybe this is not about uh, a message, but about an image that is inciting us to conversation, which I guess is exactly what's happening right now. There is a, you know, I got to choose where we started, but this one seemed like a good place to start. Any other thoughts about this one? I think I, you might want to add to the conversation. I wonder how, we'd, how we would respond if there were no title to the photograph. Yeah, I do wonder how much we, we read milk just in that white liquid versus reading milk through knowing that it's there and, and what that suggests to us. Was there somebody else? Um, was yeah, so we have, we have Chuck and then Paul and then Chris. Okay. Yeah, it's, so it's, it's interesting to think that like, if you were really milking a cow, you'd be, you know, that's not the part you'd hold on to. You'd be exactly. grabbing on to like where the fingers are. I think, I mean, I've never milked a cow, but I've seen it in movies. Um, so it's like, a, it's a, it's a, it's a hand fingers gripping a hand, but not the fingers. So there's this other sort of odd level of abstraction that is, I, I find it, I find this to be a deeply unsettling photo. I do not <laughs> find it to be comforting in the least. Uh, it's difficult for me to look at, I think. I don't even the sort of outer space references, which I'd normally think would be great. I it's just a disturbing picture. And yet he volunteered to speak, making us look at slightly longer than we would have if he had. Yeah, not. sorry. <laughs> no, it's all right. I'm not as disturbed by it as you are, but um, was uh, was Paul uh, next? Yeah, Paul is next. I guess uh, in full disclosure, I've lived with this picture for a little while because Lindley just graduated from our grad program here in mm -hmm. Chicago. And so I remember when it first appeared on uh, our grad seminar wall. And it's been, um, it's an unforgettable image because it's just so filled with tension. That, that's what I really enjoy about it. It's like the specificity of the photograph, but the whole decontextualization of who's doing what it's clearly a latex glove you know it's not it's the, it's it's uh decontextualized from a kind of normal way milking happens nourishment happens the uh tension between organic inorganic and so it kind of it's so specific it keeps you in the picture but it doesn't yield a kind of easy narrative that's that's what i love about it i i guess i've always had a narrative in mind you know and it's and it has to do with my own childhood where kids will do weird things at night because this activity is not a daytime activity it's a flash at night and um but i i that's what i love about lindsley lindley's work is it's just so filled with kind of tension between what the camera shows you and what the camera doesn't really fully explain so um, this is a great one to start with as far as that goes and i think that tension is such a good word too because even if you think about the squeeze that's required from the hands, which is its own kind of tension in the making of the, the fists around the gloves, but that that is forcing exactly the right amount of tension of the liquid against yeah. the glove yeah. itself. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's All a right. good point. And, and Chris is next. Yeah, I mean, I, without the title, I would recognize it as milk right away, but largely because uh, Portland artist Nan Curtis, who's a very good artist, did did a series of pieces that were about sort of the physicality of pregnancy and motherhood. When she tattooed a ruler on her belly, um, <laughs> which became inaccurate during the course of her pregnancy. Um, but she also photographed um, of squirting milk out of her nipples, 
and uh, and it looks just like that. <laughs> so I would recognize it from that. But it was sort of interesting to me when when I was seeing her work. It's like, oh yeah, we have a lot of women artists, but they're they're supposed to pretend to be men artists. They're not supposed to talk about experiences that men don't have. Mm. Right, right. So on that note, I'm going to use that as the segue to our first poem. Um, which is a poem by Dina Metzger, and I'll read it, and you're welcome to read it along. After seven, sorry, cows. After seven lean years, we are promised seven fat ones if the cows do not die first. Some care must be taken to prevent their demise in the scrub or the slaughterhouse. There must be enough bones to throw and to bury. The skull of the cow, I put it on, there are many strewn in the field. There has not been much rain. I look through the eyes, that is, my eyes replace the eyes that death has taken. I can see out or through. It is not a bad fate to be a cow, to be at once so awkward, so full of grace, so full of milk. Everywhere the udders are full, the teats are ready. The mouth of the calf is soft and deep. I would thrust my hand in it, for the wet joy of being so used. My own breasts are marked from the time the milk came in too fast. I did not have time to grow to the moment of giving. It is fitting that beauty leaves such scars. Milk has passed through my fingers, has spurted through my fingers, but not once during these seven lean years. I do not say that I have taken a mysterious photo and paired it with an easy poem. Uh, I think they are equally strange and strangifying, having strange effects on us. But what strikes you about the poem? It's sort of the same question that we opened with on the photograph. What, what are you noticing? What are you drawn to? What's, what are you uncertain about with the poem? I see Chuck has his hand raised. So, I mean, like the photograph, there's sort of cow parts. There's sort of the skull of the cow and the bones of the cow. And we talk about like the, the udders. It's all, it's sort of, there's the cowness of it, but the cowness is sort of made up of these parts that are maybe strewn across the landscape as well. So it's, to me, that's what's striking about it in terms of the relation to the photograph. Dan Doris has put into the chat this idea of the lean years, right? The no milk, no, no babe, the sadness, the memory that there's um, maybe more clear emotional reference in the poem than the photograph. And Chris has his hand raised. Yeah, and I think I'll like the photograph, I find that, you know, the, the poem and the photograph to be matching in terms of empathy, you know, that to be putting on the, the cow's skull and looking through its eye holes is, is to say, we are, we are not different, we are the same. And when, uh, when my best friends started the organic farm at, at Evergreen, they got a cow donated to them, it was a champion milk cow that the owners couldn't stand to send it off to bake hamburger out of because it had won too many blue ribbons. So they donated it to the farm and, and uh, Brody, her name was. And uh, at one point, Jimmy was uh, sort of uh, establishing his relationship with this cow and, and was trying to manhandle her back into the barn or whatever. And she kind of looked over at him, put one hoof on top of his foot and looked at him for about five seconds and then took her foot off and went back to what she was doing. <laughs> to sort of say, you know, you. You only think of me in terms of what my use is to you, but I'm my own being and I mm -hmm. have my own things I want to do. So is, are the, the remnants of cow that we see here their own being? Uh, well, I would say that the, 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 the remnants of cow are no longer their own being, but the, uh, but the, um, poet stepping into the head of the cow <laughs> is its own being. And Marvin has his hand raised. Uh, 
Uh, thanks. Um, I, I keep um, focusing on the uh, what is it? one fourth and fifth stanzas, which are make me very sad. Um, that the kind of regret. She missed her time too. The milk came in too fast. She did not have time. Uh, so she missed more than the, the seven lean years. I just keep looking at that and feeling bad. Um, that that's really all. Yeah, it's interesting to think about where, where it, it, temporally, where that time is in relationship to the seven lean years, or did those precede these seven year, lean years? Are they part of the seven lean years? It's hard to think about a milk coming in too fast, not having time enough to grow into something as being about leanness, but I can't quite tell how the the time all fits together in this poem. Does the poem make us think differently about the photo or does the photo make us think differently about the poem in any way? I mean, obviously they only got paired because uh, of my pretty little head. So I'm not saying that one influenced the other, but I'm just wondering what it means to have the juxtaposition of that image with the poem. Well, I would say that this, there seems to be more, I think someone mentioned this more regret in, in the poem, whereas the image seems to, um, I don't know, have more, more life, like a life force as I kind of compare and contrast the two. Which is really interesting given what Paul reminded us about the, it's about like the natural and the artificial, right? The milk and the glove. But yet there is something maybe because it captures motion or just because it doesn't have, there's much more of a story here. And it's a story that people have said have the sense of loss or regret. Mm -hmm. And Chuck is next. Although I'm not sure we said this about the photo, but it just kind of occurs to me that the milk in the, in the photo, there's not a receiver for it. It's just spilling into the, it, there, the, you could easily read just as much about that's a loss of the milk because there's no, there's no yeah. animal there to be nourished by it. Yeah, there's a weird, I can't quite, I don't think it would be quite dead center in the poem if the poem was written out in one column instead of two, but that sort of central moment in the poem about the mouth of the calf is so, pardon me, the mouth of the calf is soft and deep. I would thrust my hand in it for the wet joy of being so used. And I feel like even though the skulls are and the scrub and there are some other descriptors in this poem, but there's something about that description that I find particularly compelling. And it is a reminder that the other poem is, well, you know, there's no person even attached to the hands, let alone, as you said, Chaka, a recipient for the milk. Marvin? Well, I also keep looking at the lines, is it fitting that beauty leaves such scars, which puts a, a different take on the stretch marks, the scars that can be left on a woman's breast for nursing, that's, it's their beauty marks. That, that's, I, I like that image. Yes, yeah. that's true because of the, what they represent. And I think also the, the more metaphorical starring of what seems to be um, the lean landscape, the landscape that has the skulls strewn across it. Ralph? Yeah, thank you, thanks. Um, one thing that, uh, that uh, written the language has that visual the language doesn't is, is I think a, uh, a much greater vocabulary. And in this poem, we, we, time has passed, memories are involved, um, uh, there, there's a transference of the spirit. There's a lot of action going on and a lot of years in, in uh, compressed into uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven stanzas. 
the photo, as we mentioned earlier, is as is of one moment, like all photos are, one moment where the squeeze got out the the first little drops, and uh, and there it is. It just seems to be uh, the limitations or the language of photography is momentary, and the language of this poem to me is kind of soaring and kind of tran transcendent. And, uh, and I think that they both used their own language and their own form for expression. I think the cows is just more expressive because there's more there. The, uh, language will do that, uh, written language will do that. But I think that the, uh, that the glove uh, or the, the f photograph has its own power, but it's just very different in that it's concentrating on such a split microsecond of time. Yeah, and I think that, you know, there are, there are three temporal moment, moments for sure in this poem, right? There's a, a past from the time the milk came in too fast, right? I did not have time. That is a past. There's a moment. I, I, I put it on, I look, I can see there's stuff that is happening in the present tense. And there is, it's Chris noted in the chat, this implied future, right? We are promised seven fat ones. So the idea that something is supposed to happen after this. And Chris, did you have more to add? I see now see your hand is up. Yeah, I just wanted to, to say that while what Ralph says is true, that a photograph is literally a moment in most cases, um, that my reaction to the to the uh, photograph was that it was an archetype, that it was not attached to any particular moment. And I think, you know, it's the nature of photography that photography defeats time in a way that nothing before the invention of photography that human beings had ever did. You know, if, you're, if your grandparents died before you were born, that's it, you never saw them until photography came along. So I think photography, um, uh, conquered time and space simultaneously. You know, we've all seen pictures from the surface of Mars where none of us have been to. I think there might have been some prior to photography painters or even sculptors who believed that they were capturing something across time. But I understand that you have the all the prejudice of a photographer and I won't try and talk you out of them <laughs> this late date. Um, I'm tempted to take us on to the next photograph unless there's more that somebody is waiting to say on this poem. Does it look like we're good, Molly? Yeah, I think we're good. Okay, so now for something completely different. Okay. So take a moment, and if I have maybe one opening question here, it would be, where are we supposed to be looking in this particular photograph? And how do we know that that's where we're supposed to be looking? I should also say, I think this photograph is not actually up in the gallery. It's in the catalog, but not in the gallery. Is that correct, Molly? I think, yeah. So that's what you all got for coming to tonight's salon, a little extra something. Yay, thank you. Um, and Chris has his hand up. Yeah, big mouth. Um, I feel like this photograph, we're looking at, we're looking through Kotek's eyes at her own reflection. I feel like that's that's where we're looking at and how, and our path to it. How do you know that's where we're looking? I feel that's where we're looking. <laughs> right, what gives you that feeling of that's where we're looking, Chris? Well, uh, having, having done a, 150 of Blue Sky's posters and put decided which pictures to put on the covers of the Blue Sky books. I think having having uh, the ability to make eye contact with an image is is very powerful. And that that uh, you know if I was trying to decide what image to put on a poster, one where where a viewer would stop and make eye contact with the image is is the one. So I, I'm just naturally drawn to that. Uh, you know, there's there's some eyes looking with this strong emotional sort of longing and regret. And I think, you know, human beings are programmed to respond to each other's emotions where we're pack animals, you know. If you're, if you're upset, I need to know why. You know? 
Um, and, uh, and then I think, I think I moved from that onto the hand and this, and this sort of sense of trying to reach across this divide of reality and, and what is wished for. And Poncho has Santa. Uh, what I find interesting, um, somewhat responding to what Chris just said, I think if we were looking at her through her eyes, the angle would be different. I find it interesting that the, the perspective of the viewer is off to her side. And so we're watching her watch herself in the reflection. So it seems to me we're not exactly seeing her through her own eyes. I think if the, if the position of the looker were directly behind her, that would be a very different perspective and we would be more looking at her through her own eyes, but by the angle being to the side, we're watching her watch herself. Yeah, it's interesting to me that you put it that way. I was having a, a similar feeling for, 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 for somewhat that I feel like Kutek's eyes are not meeting my eyes. And we, in thinking of some of the photographs that we've discussed in previous salons, there are ones where, boy, you are riveted by the eyes of the subject looking so directly at you as the viewer. Um, and, uh, but then there's this question of, so what is Kotek looking at? And Yu Yang has put into the chat a longing for the outside. Do you want to say any more about that? Uh, yeah, um, I think this is like a, like a generalized uh, conclusion of like longing for the outside. But to be more specific, um, I'm looking at these photos and it has windows, it also has bars, the, 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 the cross frame of the window that could, to me, that implies the, um, the bars. And then we have this, uh, this, this, this subject looking, 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 looking out, looking, looking outward, or at least it's implying it's looking outward, but all um, she can, she can saw was her own reflection. That's where I found this um, inability to escape uh, where she currently um, is, and uh, and also this longing for the uh, this like you know this 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 desire for looking through the window, trying to um, looking for something has also uh, is also connected through connected to the history of um, history of you know women's being. Uh, primarily, a, a uh, primarily um, situated in a domestic environment, and then you know, especially in Ooh, yeah. like fifties, fifty and sixties, women's are primarily um, conditioned to do like you know domestic chores. They were never allowed, especially in the fifties, they were never allowed to go outside. So, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if this is like a really fast stretch, but uh, I do read a lot from from, from these photos. That's what I read. Yeah, and it's an interesting read, especially since we can't see much of uh, much detail about Kotek, but Kotek does seem to be made up and wearing a fantastic necklace. I would mm -hmm. hate to be trapped inside just when I'm so fabulously made up and fabulously uh, necklaced. Um, and it's also interesting, your comment would made me think about the fact that it, the title here says Kotek looking at her own reflection, but we also are only looking at her reflection primarily. The only parts that are not reflection are the hands. Molly, it looked like you were ready to jump in. Did you want to say yeah, more on that? Uh, yeah, Chris has his hand up, but I'll just say like, that's what I was struck by. The subject is in fact the reflection, although the subject is, is hidden. So it's, it's, I put myself in the position of the hands and, and, and Kotek, but we're relying on understanding this person or this image through that reflection. So it's, it, yeah, it's a really interesting play on that, the power of the reflection. But um, Chris is up next. Wait, I'm gonna say something before Chris goes just to torture him a little bit. 
No, just to respond to what Molly said, which is that actually, as you were speaking, I was thinking if it weren't for that title, I wouldn't even necessarily be sure that those are Kotek's hands. Mm -hmm. I, I am assuming that they are because of the title, which is to say there could be one body, which is the, the body on one side of the window whose hands we are seeing and another body on the other side of the window whose face and torso and lifted hand we are seeing. And those could those are not necessarily the same body, except if we believe the title telling us that this is Kotek looking at her own reflection and we assume that's what we're seeing. Um, okay, Chris, you've been very a very patient person. Well, you say I'm very patient. On the other hand, I've been talking with my ear off, so I haven't been very uh, patient. But uh, yes, for me, I, I see a lot of the same elements that Yu Yang sees. But for me, when I look at this image, it seems to me to be about being um, uh, about feeling that you're the wrong gender for what your body actually is. So I see it as being about that that the outside of this person is longing to get to the inside of this person. And that what we see in the reflection is how, how the subject sees themselves. And that if we if the camera was to rotate around, that, that, that they would not, they'd no longer be wearing a fabulous necklace, that that's, that that's part of what they're bringing to their, their uh, self image that, that the real world is not necessarily accommodating. That's just my reading though. No, I, I think that you're onto something. I mean, there's there's something about uh, gender identity going on in this picture. I don't think you're overreading to say that, but it's interesting to to bring together your comment and Yu Yang's talking about interiority and exteriority of a physical building space and interior and exteriority of a sense of self, um, uh, an internal identity versus a physical way that we present or a physical way that we're read in the world. Um, and I think uh, Doris has sort of added the, this, I sent, this sense of being trapped even within oneself in the chat. Molly, who's, who's got yeah, hands we up? Have, we have Chuck and then Marvin. I guess, I, 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 you know, if I didn't know, if, if I didn't know the name of the picture, I would also say that this picture could is easily be about her fascination with the space beyond the window like she could be looking at herself but her eyes are also looking at this space which is outside and I'm very fascinated by like is that the backyard like what 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 is that um I don't quite get the longing I mean that people are talking about because I see more um fascination or like a sense of curiosity maybe to sort of to want to to want to touch the outside and yeah it's easy to read the stuff about gender but if if it was more if the gender issues which are at the forefront of think of our minds were more normalized it's just a person looking out the window and wondering about the space outside so when you say it were, were more normalized you mean that we still live in a in a world in which there is, a, at least our society, a lot of normativity and that this feels outside, but there is a, a universe in which this person's, how they present in terms of gender identity wouldn't feel outside normativity. And then we might yeah. be looking at this picture differently. Yeah. And, and that, yeah, so that I feel like it's true that's a fancy necklace, uh, but it, you could also see, you know, uh, it, that just could just be the way she looks on a regular day. And this is sort of her, everydayness like hey i wonder what's outside i'm looking out the window and i'm fascinated by the by the world outside but it's interesting that we jumped to questioning of gender identity when there might not be a lot those questions might all might have been answered a long time ago mm. right right so that's also maybe our what we impose the narrative i think is it marvin next Mar and then marvin paul? and then paul marvin then paul. hi this is um Tangential, <laughs> so and uh, it it it, uh, uh, it strikes me just looking at this. That I remembered that one of the classical uh, standards of portraiture, and you'll see this in many oil paintings you see in, in, in museums, is that one eye is in the center uh, uh, horizontally mm -hmm. of the picture, and the, the artist has done that here, and so it strikes me is, is this something that happens universally over a long period of time because artists do that um, 
naturally or did the artist here have an intent in doing something that is so, such a classic standard of portraiture? Yeah, and I, that question about sort of what are some of the allusions or riffs uh, for this photograph, I think are really interesting ones. I'll also just note, as I, I know not everybody's uh, able to see the chat, that people have been talking about sort of the sense of shallowness in this space uh, or what you might not see beyond what's outside or even the question of whether everything we're seeing reflected, whether we're seeing anything outside reflected or whether, sorry, whether we're seeing any of the outside or whether all we're seeing is what's a reflection of the inside. Mm -hmm. um, was and Paul up next and then Paul, Ralph? Paul is up next and then Ralph. Yeah, I, I'll just end the conversation by saying I love how this picture relates to Lindley's picture in the sense that it's mm -hmm. equally descriptive but also decontextualized. Um, this like film noir lighting that is um, adds a lot of disquiet, I think, to the picture, you know, and I use the word tension again. And um, but like Chris, I, I, I don't see a person looking at what the outside is. It's all left kind of abstract. But I do like Chris, see this human trying to touch this reflection of themselves because there is a physical trying to touch and the way Kotek, it, her or they are looking at their hand is it's filled with a kind of apprehension, you know, like there's a kind of alienation between the way they feel on one side and the way they seem to be peer looking at themselves on the other. And again, there's a kind of trying to connect but not connecting and just the way light and shadow and in harshness of the description, which is so photographic. I just, I just, you've got to read the emotion of the, the those formal choices that uh, make suffuse both those pictures with just a lot of like uneasiness, um, and that adds to the narrative, um, which I think is really interesting, and I think supports what Chris was saying, without completely, completely explain, you know, going there fully, you know, it hints at that. So, uh, and I, thanks. I would add to everything that you just said that the fact that the hands on the inside are so because of lighting and focus and uh, the distortion of the window are so much crisper than mm -hmm. the body outside so uh, that that tension I think is also there between what's in focus is not necessarily accurate in terms of the photography but um, but in terms of what we are perceiving the crispness of of these two body parts versus the crispness of the reflected body. Ralph, you have been very patient. What have you got? You just, you just think I've been patient. I, so, um, You've comported yourself as though you were patient, Ralph. You what have you got? Thank you. Thank you very much. That's, that's, all I, that's all I can do usually most of the time is comport myself. Um, I, I, I would like to talk about the influences on this image. Uh, uh, Chris had a had a comment about it, and uh, uh, who else was up here that had? Uh, Yu Yang had one too about what the bars mean and the windows, and uh, mm -hmm. but 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 I think given that this is 2019 and that this is uh, a contemporary photographer, younger from my point of view, but you know, uh, as is as is everybody, but um, <laughs> but for. Uh, photography, uh, someone that's making pictures today. I think that the uh, this is purely speculative, and that's why I, I like this uh, format and uh, and uh, coming in every month here because you get to think this way. Um, th there has been a lot of use of uh, of glass and uh, and transference in movies in cinema, a lot of going through time and space and crossing time barriers or space barriers. Um, movies uh, where superheroes transform into something else. And I think that, 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 that I'm just speculating about that imagery sort of becoming part of the window uh, motif and that whether or not that's a, uh, that the pain is a is a solid piece of glass or it's some kind of shimmering shield or power source that I think is 
is also could be at play as well. The the influence of the other side and going to the other side and breaking through and all of that. I think that that it can be added on to the other more conventional and more maybe historic use of frame and uh, and bar. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. I, right, that the, there seems to be a quite literal window in here, but that windows are so often also serve as, as metaphors or serve metaphorically. I, and I wanna say I've been keeping an eye on the chat too. So I, I feel pretty confident from the title, that the title is telling us that Kotek uses she, her pronouns. Um, and uh, that that is giving us some information about, about how Kotek identifies, although our reading of Kotek's body may also be about how we read bodies or what our expectations of bodies are. Um, and there was also the, the comment in about if you imagine yourself to be Kotek, right? So I, instead of me looking at Kotek, looking at her own reflection, but me embodying Kotek, if I'm in that body, imagining where I'm looking, I might be looking at my hand, but I might also be reaching out as if to touch my face through this pain, this window, which again, as people have been saying, can be literal or metaphorical. I'm sort of excited to get to the poem that I chose to pair with this. Shall I do that? Okay. Yeah. I have to say, I came upon this poem a few months ago and kind of fell in love with it. Um, and it's also an interesting one to think about when we think about what, uh, what illusions might be someplace. So I will read it to you um, as best I can that Zoom may be covering up pieces of it. Uh, it's called Exclusively on Venus. Roses are red. Violets are transsexual. Welcome to womanhood. Now get to work, honey. Roses are performative. Violets are biological. I have very sensitive breasts and so do your breasts. Roses are biological. You have the nicest skin. I can't stop kissing you. Let's read more non-dualistic queer theory. Roses are fed up with our binary fetishes. I tricked my doctors and stole all the medication to hide it in a cave and share it with other trans people. Roses have got me up against the wall, kissing my neck, which is socially constructed to be a super hot, strong feminist neck. Roses are violet. Violets are roses. I really like you. I like you too. Roses are born this way. Violets have a lesbian streak. Something about your dry sense of humor and our soft intertwined limbs feels transcendently female. Roses are blue. Violets are violet. Roses are nonviolet. Blue is blue normative. Roses are from Mars. Violets had the whole surgery, setting up camp exclusively on Venus. Roses have gone too far not to be what girls are made of. I'm coming out to my academic colleagues as a poet and I bet they will run away screaming. Roses are roses. Violets are born this way. Someone's got a horde of heteronormative trans affirmative trans affirmation porn. Roses are cheeky. I want you to fuck me, drown violets like an accused witch in your arms, which feel like mine. Violets got a name change, roses changed a pronoun. We ate at a restaurant and forgot to put the leftovers in the fridge. Roses are trochaic, violets have their original plumbing. Let's march in a protest, then go home and we'll cook something delicious and eat it with a spork. Violets are permanent, roses are impermanent. Thank you for becoming me offering to embrace your form, your fate. Flower beds are umbrellas, umbrellas are rubrics. I support your identification and your disidentification. Men are from women, roses are from Jupiter. Women are from men. I can't tell which is softer, your lips or this pillow or the snow descending gracefully outside. We missed doing a poem last month when it was officially National Poetry Month, but I feel like we're all on top of it now. Um, what's going on in this poem? Or what's, what's striking you about this poem? We have Marvin. Oh, 
Oh, Marvin, you're still muted. I'm mute. Marvin. I'm sorry. It's pressing the wrong button. We is trace male or female? That's the first thing that strikes me. I know a male trace. I think that if trace wanted a name that was clearly one or the other, trace would be writing under that name. I think if Trace wanted the name Trent or the name Teresa, Trace would have gone with a name like Trent or Teresa. I think Trace may be enjoying the ambiguity of Trace as a name. Would it change your reading of the poem to have definitive information, she, he, or they? Well, um, I assumed it was a woman um, from the language and the images until I got down to the name. Then I was confused. Um, and I assume that, um, that, as you said, that confusion is not entirely unintended. Let us explore that possibility. Do other people feel like this is a poem that is intended uh, more for confusion or ambiguity than for definitive? Uh, anything? Well, I think it's striving for not, not the definitive um, and challenging our expectations and norms and how we, I, how we label things um, or even the notion of what's, you know, male, female connotations and turning everything on its, on its head. And uh, of course this poem, it starts, roses are red. Have you ever come across a poem that started roses are red before, right? So it takes the most basic formulaic of things that get thrown in the category of poem and starts playing from there. But also because it keeps doing that over and over again, it has um, this repetition at the beginning of each line. I'm completely blanking on what the literary term is for that when the um, lines repeat the same opening, but it, roses are red, roses are performative, roses are biological, roses are fed up, roses have got me up against the wall, roses are violet, roses are born this way, roses are blue, roses are from Mars, roses have gone too far, roses are roses, roses are cheeky, roses change to pronoun, roses are trochaic, roses are impermanent, Roses are from Jupiter, right? Roses are roses of roses. They're ubiquitous. They're important. They're directing the poem. They're driving the poem, but they are also not consistently any one thing and seemingly contradictory as well as, you know, uh, anthropomorphized and many other things. Marvin, is your hand back up? Yes, um, it takes an extraordinary amount of guts to begin a poem, Roses Are Red. And then when I'm thinking, oh no, you get punched in the nose with violence are violets are transsexual. I said, I love that. It's just really, she's already um, signaled that she's going to be screwing around with us. Yes. Or he or it or they. I don't know. Well, Trace, let us say Trace is going to be screwing around with us. And I may have missed uh, the, the, I think it's the only rhymed stanza in this whole poem is the um, roses are red, violets are born this way. Someone's got a horde of heteronormative trans affirmation porn, you say? I may have missed that on the first time I was reading it because of what Zoom was covering up, right? Which is also hilarious that, that we tend to associate, and I think we've talked about this in previous salons, we tend to associate rhyme with a kind of sing-song poesy for children. And this is playing extra on that because of the heteronormative trans affirmation porn, porn you say as being such a hilariously not child rhyme. Um, other folks have thoughts or questions or comments about this poem? Uh, 
Chris? Well, I'll just said I think it's it's reveling in the sense that you're not trapped by your gender identity and and uh, and that that's the it's a it's a sort of a uh, explosion of joy of freedom. <laughs> And I'll also say that we have on our exhibition committee, we have three people who, who are going by their initials instead of their first names now. So I don't think this is a, uh, not wanting to be trapped by your name is, is becoming very normal in, in, in uh, young people today. Yeah, and it, it's interesting that when you were talking about sort of the, um, the sense of, I've just lost the word that you use, but sort of the joy in the identity and the playfulness of the identity to think about how the tone here might contrast with uh, the photo we were just looking at of Kotek looking at her own reflection. What, are these, did I do a good job pairing them or a poor job pairing them? Do they, do they belong together or not? Well, I would say they belong together because they don't match. That the first one is a sense of longing, and I'm trapped behind these heteronormative bars. Uh, and this is a this is the explosion of what happens when the bars go away. Albert has put into the chat that the last lines are also a play on book titles. I don't. Oh, the men are from Mars, women are from Venus. That which is a sort of for those of you who don't have the, is pleasure the right word of knowing it? The uh, cultural currency, we'll just say of knowing it, it was a sort of, um, I think an academic trying to watch, write for a popular audience idea about uh, gender difference in language from, uh, gosh, I'm trying to guess what decade, maybe the 1990s, I don't know. It's not on my bookshelf to check. Um, other, thoughts about this poem? Um, let's see, Ralph has his hand up. I do. Yeah, thank you. Um, just a couple of lines that that were not part of the entire poem, but ones that I just liked. The one that's, you know, which is uh, Violet's got a name, name change. Roses changed a pronoun. We ate at a restaurant and forgot to put the leftovers in the fridge. And roses are trochaic, violets have their original plumbing. Let's march in protest, then go home and we'll cook something delicious and eat it with a spork. I like those juxtapositions of the ordinariness in their lives as well as this sense of new language, new definition, new who I am, but also an acknowledgement that, you know, and then you go and you see a movie or then you go and you have dinner or then you go and, uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, you forget to put leftovers in the fridge. I like the mundane and the passionate at the same time. I, that those, those lines really worked uh, for me. And also I have to say like every time I read this poem, I'm like, I forgot about the spork. I love the spork, that the spork is a essentially gender non-binary um, uh, eating utensil, right? Oh, it is I neither spoon nor fork, but it is both spoon oh. and fork. That's beautiful. I had not thought of that, and absolutely. <laughs> oh, yeah. no, that's great. That's spork, great. Spork. Um, is anybody else got a hand up? Um, you know, Chuck did, but um, no longer. So anyone else? I was just going to say the same thing about the spork, but Lois already, you know. <laughs> Sorry. <I'm> <laughs> Would you like to say something about the gender nine bond area of forgetting to put the leftovers in the fridge? Uh, I, I don't have quite that. I would I would say that for, for those of you who who know there's a there's a Lily Allen song called Chinese that to me is the most wonderful love song ever and it talks about you know I'm gonna getting in on a plane and then maybe we'll go out and get some Chinese and it's just it's just sort of this really mundane you know uh, um, look at at the real world instead of the romantic world that we normally talk about love in yeah yeah and I think um... There are a number of places where this poem is also playing with expectations, right? That, that line about, um, how does it begin? Sorry, I have to move things on the screen so I can actually read the poem. Roses have gone too far not to be what girls are made of. I'm coming out and you think, oh, I know where this is going. I'm coming out to my academic colleagues as a poet and I bet they will run away screaming, which is also this idea of like what shocks 
what seems like it's going too far, what is the unexpected? I think that's another, um, another place where this poem is really playing with, with humor to get us at our own expectations. I any more here or shall we peek at one last photo? I think we're good here. All right, so we had three photographers in the gallery, so I wanted to make sure we get three images. Um, and as you look at this photo by Tyler Clark, I want to ask you how the other photos or maybe the poems that we've just been looking at might shape your reading of this photo. And I don't know how many of you have encountered the photo before, um, but what, ha have we set some strange context or some important context for reading this photograph through the ones that we've already looked at or the poems that we've been looking at? Or anything else you want to say about this photograph, you can um, you can defy me and just say any interesting thing that you have to share. Well, well I think similar to the other images and poems, it's sort it's especially um, pre the 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 poem we just looked at as as um, yeah, as well as the first image, as well as the second image, but you know, sort of upsetting our expectations and and also commenting on the, I don't know, sort of the possibility, the possibilities of, of form and identification and challenging us to further kind of investigate what, what we're really looking at. Yeah, Doris has put in the chat, I find this image really unsettling and hard to look at. I am not at all disagreeing, Doris, but do you want to say more about what what is so unsettling for you in this photograph? Yeah, okay, I guess I have to unmute myself. Uh, it, I can't tell what's up and down and what's happening and it, it, there is a violence in it that I sense uh, and a, a disrespect to the person. I, I just, I can't, I looked at it yesterday for a while and I can't make sense of it just from, a, from an image point of view, but it also, I, I find it creepy. Creepy and upsetting. Again, I am in no intention of disagreeing with you on their being creeped out by this, but I wonder whether there are folks who feel differently about it, who, for, for whom the response is not that, that creepiness. Well, I find it much more emotionally ambiguous. I, I think it's, I, I think it's, uh, uh, like, like most art that I really end up liking, it sort of has every emotion built into it, <laughs> available, available to your questioning, you know. Can I you can give us a sense of that? I, be, I think for, for people who are feeling a little less, a little more unsettled by it. <laughs> well, I find some humor in it. Um, I, 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 I don't assume that this is something that somebody has done to this person. I, I assume that this is a, this is a uh, position that this person is willingly putting their body in. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I think that the, what the photographer is bringing to it is not the actual contortion of it, but the, but the appreciation of what happens with the hair and the hairline. Um, so I guess I, I find it, uh, I find it to be um, more uh, playful than than uh, than somebody who's creeped out by it would. What are some of the details that are striking, folks, about this photograph? Chris mentioned that the hairline, like there's this very prominent part in really thick hair, but also a piece, a, a place where as the hair cascades down towards the front, um, there's skin or scalp that's not covered. Are there other things that, that are 
that we should be drawing our attention to in terms of details around this photograph. Doris wants to know if it would look or feel different if the image was turned 180 degrees. Now I'm going to go like this. I do think there is something about he heads on the bottom that um, that are that's already off. But it's really fun to watch everybody actually in the side of the Zoom going like this. Um, but there's also some relationship to where if, if those are back pockets on a pair of uh, pants that are really being worn where the front are supposed to be and the back is supposed to be, then it, there's also a lot of confusion for me about how that head is folding. I'm, I don't know this particular yoga pose. I don't know what, what the Sanskrit name is for this one. And I suspect actually that probably the way this is happening is that somebody else may be holding up this person's legs so that they're not supporting their body weight in this position. But that's just a guess because, and you know, normally I am trying to get people not to read things. Doris has said it's a shoulder stand, but I think it's only a shoulder stand if the pants are on backwards. Um, normally I, am not, I always say like, don't try and figure out how they set up the picture. Let's just read what the image that they've created. But I find this one too disturbing and I just, like I, my, my mind wants to make right body parts that seem to be in the wrong place. This well, is yeah. basically if you start off lying face down on the ground and then lift your legs up in the air with your, with your chest and face still on the ground, that's, what's, that's the body position. But the arms aren't, like we don't see arms that could be holding up the body, correct? I would assume the arms are going straight down from from the shoulders to where the feet used to be before you pick the feet up and put them in the air. Okay, so you're gonna try that? <laughs> we could all try that. Hey, that's the surprise ending to this month's salon, is that now I'm gonna ask you all to get into this position while your camera is on. <laughs> Yeah, so it's disorienting in that way because I even where the face might be down or up, if it in fact is a shoulder stand. Yeah, so <laughs> Albert has a comment. Well, I have a circus background and uh, the contortionist can really blow your mind. <laughs> with what he or she can do uh, and put their bodies in the certain positions you go, I'm suddenly feeling very, very uncomfortable or I'm, my back is killing me. But um, it could also be the contortion, uh, contortionist who's just in the process of it. But that may be, that's just my thought. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's definitely something that feels contorted here, but it's also really interesting like that this is happening on what looks like a kind of nice plush rug. Um, I wanna know more about the space that we're in. Um, I can't quite tell it, what we're seeing in the background of the space, sort of if you went directly over from the pants pocket, is that um, fancy dark wood on the wall? I, mean, I can't tell. I'm not gonna pretend that I can, but is there- um, I say it's a cabinet. Yeah, but like what space are we in and why is the contortioning happening in this space? It's Not a, that I... House. It doesn't look like a rug that, that, that a 20 year old would have. <laughs> it's definitely not inside the circus tent is what you're saying. And, well, when I say the, the longer I look at it, like my, the ability to breathe becomes hard. You know, I, I'm just wondering about like trying to take a, a, a breath and it becomes like a little bit suffocating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, you know, the, um, the title of this exhibition is what a body moves through. And it's interesting to think about 
that particular title in relationship to the three photographs that we've looked at. Um, the first one of which is the, the hands with the glove. Um, and the second one of which is that sense of Kotek looking at a reflection that also implies the internal and the external. And this picture where we just are having a lot of, some of us feel uh, more at ease or less at ease than others about how this body is placed, but, but this is a body that doesn't look like we expect bodies to look. Yeah, the, this whiteness at the, um, Ken has asked in the chat, how do people read the white shape at one end of the part in the hair? And I'm assuming you mean lower down in the photo. To me, it feels like that's actually far ahead. And what we're seeing, my hair is neither long nor thick enough to really do it, is sort of the hair falling down like that. Um, so that that's far ahead that we're seeing, but that, that because of how the hair falls onto the floor, we, we don't have a sense of that. Although it also, that also makes it feel like it's that part is running um, Ralph. back front. Yeah, Ralph. Yeah, um, just on, on what, what is this? Uh, when I first saw it, uh, I, I thought it was the rear end of a dog. It, it looks uh, like the asshole of a dog. And the way that the hair comes down is not, does not remind me of the way that human hair comes down over the shoulders and on the back, but it looks like the way that dogs are combed. So when I looked at it initially, those were the hits that I got of it out of it. And I think that, that that's just part of what we're all talking about is that this is a headshot and yet uh, the, the photographer does everything uh, that he can to, to um, disrupt how we put things together. And if this looks like the rear end of a dog with long hair, then it's gonna be quite a trip to get back to this is the head of someone. I just like the way that all of this is ambiguous and also disassociated from, from the usual connections of the human body. And that to me, the, the fact that, it make, that you think of it as maybe not even a human, but more of an animal, it just, uh, it just shows how, how can, just how we put things together, how we, how we make sense out of imagery and the details that the photographer offers us are pretty limited and we just end up uh, going all over the place, which is, is I think uh, uh, part of his work. Yeah, and I, I think that we, I, like we're, we're sort of spitting out of the chat with like more possibilities of maybe, maybe that's a hairpiece, it's not a human at all. Um, uh, Chris has posted a picture of uh, himself from a much earlier stage of yoga class that he was in several weeks ago so that we could see how bodies can contort. And I think that that's one of the things that's interesting about this picture is that we, we want it we, we want to write it in a way that is not unrelated to our desires and yearnings about figuring out what was going on in the other photographs, but I think it's also somewhat different here, maybe in part because like this is the clearest space, like that the interior, the rug, the pants, like that's actually clearer in some ways than the first image where because of the night flash or whatever the lighting was, so much of it is just black. Um, or this second picture where there's this inside outside with the accompanying distortion. You have all been very well behaved. It's almost 6.30. Um, and we're gonna do this again on June 23rd for Joshua Dudley Greer's show, Somewhere Along the Line, which are photos along America's highways. Molly is the official voice of Blue Sky Gallery. What can you tell us? Yes, so um... This, this is, an, you'll be getting this postcard in the mail shortly. Um, and this, the current, this current show, just so you know, um, is up through, through the end of June, um, June 26th, as well as the new show that's opening in June. We are moving, kind of making this transition back from two month shows to one month shows, which beginning in July will be a full roster of 
two month shows every month. Um, we have a panel discussion actually for, the, for this show that we just talked about um, June 9th. So go, you can go onto the website and sign up um, for that. The artists, as well as the curator, because this is a curatorial show, um, will be present as well as another guest who will um, help to facilitate the conversation. So, um, and Joshua Dudley Greer's talk will be actually the day after um, the salon. So the 23rd and 24th that week, you can, you can book two opportunities, one with Lois and one um, with Joshua to learn about this exhibition. You're really, for the 23rd, we'll be booking it with each other. I'm, I'm just here to, to push things <laughs> so along you, a little bit. You bring forth the questions and get the dialogue going. So, um, And so uh, do we still need to make appointments to come into the gallery? So um, I haven't really officially announced it yet, but uh, beginning in June, the gallery will be open, um, appointments not needed. Um, we will keep the same hours Wednesday through Saturday, 12 to 5 p.m. So um, we still have to kind of figure out capacity. Um, that hasn't been a problem and I don't anticipate it, but we wanna give people the opportunity. Like today I had a lot of walk-ins, so it's great. People, are, people aren't getting out and about. Um, so that's the plan. All right, so we will see you perhaps in person in the gallery and hopefully virtually uh, at, again at the end of June. All right, thank you all. Thank you everyone. Thanks, Lois. Sure.